Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Train, and I'm the Associate Director of the Duke Initiatives in Theology and the Arts. And it's an absolute pleasure to be able to welcome you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to welcome back Dr. Jonathan Anderson um, for his lecture today. As many of you know, uh, Dr. Anderson um, completed his PhD at King's College in London. Um, and is the author of uh, a number of articles and including um, a book on modern art and the life of the culture. Um, but today, I'm especially glad to be able to thank him for his time that he spent here at Duke um, and to not actually need too much of an introduction because over the last three years, many of you not uh, everyone in this room, uh, I hope, has had the opportunity to, to learn from Dr. Anderson, to get to know him a bit. And, and so I just want to say thank you, Jonathan, for um, a, a wonderful three years here. It's, uh, some of that, unfortunately, happened during COVID time when um, we were separated and away. And, um, but we're so glad for, for friendship and the partnership and the, all the ways in which you've, you've taught us this um, last few years here. So, so thank you, Jonathan. Um, and this is a terrific way um, to celebrate some of the work and, uh, that you've been working on. And, so, and so, so glad for this opportunity to hear from you today. I'll turn it over to you. I think there'll be a, a chance for questions and answers at the end. Um, but I know some of you will have to slip out as well. So um, feel free to do that when you need to. But stick around for some conversation if you're able to. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for that, uh, Dan. I really, really appreciate it. Um, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. I just uh, uh, love it here, and it's really great to be back on campus, and great to see so many uh, familiar faces. Um, I, should, I should begin this by putting up a, a photo of my newborn son, Isaac, <laughs> who is just uh, such, a, such a joy, um, and I, uh, I should show you a picture, but I'm sure it would melt down the... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's just off the charts. Um, so anyway, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, uh, so my field of study is theology and the arts, especially the visual arts, but everything I say here you can certainly transpose into um, other art forms that you're more familiar with, because uh, certainly there will be correspondences. And the conjunctive and uh, at the center of this field, theology and the arts, often feels somewhat like this wonderful stretch of Burgstrasse in Berlin, uh, which is just across from Museum Island with the old National Gallery and so on, um, in which the department, uh, the theology department of Humboldt University lives right next door to the bookstore of the huge art publisher of Walter Koenig, which specializes in especially modern and contemporary art. These institutions are neighbors, and it seems like they would have an enormous amount to say to each other, but if I can metaphorize a bit, uh, as disciplines and discourses, they've actually been fairly estranged from each other uh, for a century or more, at least in, uh, in the, the kind of academic institutions. Um, that subtle dividing line between their facades marks significant differences in their institutional structures, uh, the floors don't align, so to speak, and there aren't readily accessible passageways or common spaces connecting these from the inside uh, often, even if historically there certainly used to be. In some cases, there's a mutual suspicion and animosity between them, and I have to say that currently uh, in the academic uh, currently, I think the academic art world is more suspicious of theology than vice versa. Uh, but I think more often, they simply don't understand each other very well, as the real energy in each tends to be generated by different histories and different points of reference, or at least different ways of speaking and thinking about those histories and references. So working in this discipline feels a bit like shuttling back and forth along the sidewalk, stepping outside of one discourse in order to enter the other, and having quite different conversations in each. And maybe uh, those of you who also work in this field, uh, so, something about how this feels. 
Um, I, uh, I don't find this arrangement to be particularly troublesome. I actually find it very invigorating and full of possibility. Indeed, the longer one spends shuttling between them, looking and listening for the other in each, the more one finds that, in fact, there are all sorts of neglected passageways between them. There are shared grammars, conceptualities, and concerns with so many different kinds of, ex of exchange possible between them. So the conjunctive and of theology and the arts seeks to connect disciplines, including art history and criticism, theology and biblical studies, that have been academically estranged for some time. Usually they don't live in such pro close proximity to each other, uh, uh, metaphorically. Um, and it strives to recognize and develop various forms of theological intelligence within <coughs> the histories and grammars of our history, and in turn to recognize and develop various forms of visual intelligence within the histories and grammars of theology, which are very much part of the inheritance of the church. And the results uh, need to hold up well both as theology and as art history. And these are some of the challenges of uh, uh, theology and the arts. Um, so there are so many different ways that scholarly traffic can move through and across this conjunctive and through and across this sidewalk, so to speak. Um, but there are two ways of working within this conjunction, two directionalities that are of particular importance to me and to my research. Are the sort of two, the two, uh, <laughs> the two ways of working that uh, I'm engaged in. First, uh, much of my work, as Dan alluded to, uh, is focused on modern and contemporary art, art after it left the church, so to speak. The histories of 20th and 21st century art have been written with an especially strong and especially problematic secularization theory at their heart, in which modernism just means secularization, and modern art is sort of liberation or emancipation from Religion. I think that's a, a, a faulty story, but it's a common one. Um, uh, and so a great deal of my work is devoted to rereading and rethinking these histories, paying closer attention to the ways that they are shaped. These histories are shaped by religious contexts and engaging in what are fundamentally theological concerns and conceptualities. Contemporary art and Christian theology have a complex and conflicted relationship, uh, it, it's true, um, but um, the two domains have an enormous amount to say to each other, both critically and constructively. Uh, this is a kind of obvious example of uh, where discussion is warranted, uh, Chris Martin's altar, uh, which... Uh, presents a, um, a steel replica of the frame of the Ghent altarpiece. Um, and so is it, it stands as a kind of open uh, question, is this an, a, a skeletal, are these the skeletal remains of a earlier Christian visuality, or, or do they function still as an aperture through which to see a kind of eschatological aperture? And I increasingly think that this dialogue between theology and modern and contemporary art is at its best when it includes deep understandings of the longer histories of Christian visual theological thinking. And not only Christian, but that's particularly my interest. Uh, and again, Martin's work is an obvious example, but um, this is true in, in many implicit ways throughout these histories. But that last point I made brings me, and this is, uh, the Ghent altar piece, by the way. Um, that uh, second, uh, that last point um, brings me to the second strand that I'm uh, really interested in in theology and the arts, uh, and that is the study of visual theology, which delves into the longer, dense, and diverse histories of Christian art over the centuries, approaching them as domains of constructive theological reasoning and biblical commentary, which operate not primarily in verbal terms, but specifically in and as visual spatial thinking, visual spatial modes of reasoning. Indeed, this is one of the vital ways the church has done its thinking through the centuries, both for better and worse. 
In one sense, this is a form of historical theology, retrieving some of the church's deep historical intelligence, genealogies, resources, and means by which faith seeks understanding uh, in the history of Christian Christianity. Uh, specifically as it pertains to one of the key forms of human intelligence, which is visual-spatial reasoning, re reasoning about relations through a visual-spatial relations. Uh, but like all forms of historical theology, it can also be both highly critical and constructive with the potential to reorganize what we see as meaningful and possible in the present. Um, in some ways, these are very different projects, um, sort of different emphases, different foci, but uh, they need each other. The, these two emphases, contemporary art and theology, or uh, contemporary modern art and theology, and visual theology, the history of Christian visual theology. But they need each other and enrich each other, especially in the formation of a visual theological imagination that's both historically deep and creatively agile. Uh, in the present. Uh, so today, I want to focus on the second of these strands. Um, well, yeah. Uh, I want to focus on the second of these strands, visual theology, and do a brief case study in, uh, uh, do a brief case study with you, experimenting with some of its problems and possibilities. And I want to take on a fairly challenging example, namely the ascension of Christ. This is a fascinating and problematic topic for visual theology because all our language for it is exceedingly spatial, yet we often find that our spatial assumptions about and treatments of this topic get us into trouble. And I want to uh, explore the way this trouble can be highly productive, theologically and exegetically productive. Specifically, I want to show how visual interactions with biblical texts and theological loci are especially adept at doing three things. First, they sensitize us to the particular visualities and visual details of biblical texts, often sending us back into the texts for closer readings. Um, where is this happening? Who is there? Why is it described in this, just this way or this order? Have we seen this textual imagery before? And so on. Secondly, um, uh, they're highly adept at fostering intertextual readings across the, the biblical canon. Images can do multiple things at once uh, by visually rhyming, alluding to, or even fusing multiple motifs together and setting them within various larger uh, environments. Uh, so, you know, this, this, in this context or in this context, images do that um, really uh, powerfully, potently. And the Bible itself does this all the time, orchestrating its own intertextuality through imagery very often. And the creation of visual images help us to sensitize us to the way that the biblical texts are doing this, drawing it out of the text and further developing it, again, both for better and worse sometimes. Third, I want to uh, show how, the, um, how visual theology, visual interactions with uh, biblical texts are adept at drawing out the, way, the kinds of visual spatial models that are already implicitly shaping our theologies and our exegeses, whoever our is, you know my, your, um, um, uh, 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 drawing out the kinds of visual spatial models that are already implicitly shaping theologies and exegeses, often in the form of unexamined default assumptions, and putting them under pressure, helping us to critically test, revise, and refine them. Indeed, theology is full of visualities and spatialities, um, our language, uh, a theological language, is exceedingly uh, visual-spatial. <clears throat> um, and these include ways of imagining the world and all manner of relatedness within it. And that means that the arts, not only the visual, but also the musical, uh, musical, kinesthetic, poetic, and so on, provide highly valuable means of sorting out, uh, sorting some of this out, both, again, critically and constructively, calling into question some of the ways that we tacitly conceptualize 
our relations to God, to each other, to ourselves, to our environments, and so on. Indeed, this is one of the things that Scripture itself consistently does once again, critiquing, repairing, and reworking ancient spiritualities. I mean, there's some like mind-boggling um, critique of uh, ancient spatialities in, uh, in the text, and it happens all over the place. And of course, uh, I think these texts also have the capacity to repair and rework contemporary spatialities. Okay, uh, so how does all this work out? Um, uh, on, on to our case study, um, in, in which I want to look at a handful of images of the ascension of Christ, beginning with some that set up the problem. And we'll start with uh, Giotto. There's something consistently disappointing about most images of the ascension, I have to confess. Uh, especially in the West, I think, from about the Middle Ages to today, late Middle Ages anyway. Even here in Giotto's incredible paintings in the Arena Chapel in Padua. I mean, the Arena Chapel's unbelievable. Uh, but once you come to his uh, handling of the Ascension, um, there's a remarkable sense of indecision built into it. The Ascension passages at the end of Luke and beginning of Acts provide the reader with some key elements. A gathering of disciples, Jesus is taken up, a cloud hides him from their vision, and two men in white clothing appear. And Giotto includes all of that, but doesn't seem to know what to do with Jesus once he puts everything into uh, um, a single spatial framework, which is one of the primary innovations of the Renaissance that Giotto helped to spark. Um, <clears throat> uh, am amidst this indecision, Giotto places the ascending Christ on this sort of uh, cloud form, and I think that cloud form in the center of the image is really a kind of icon of the indecision and sort of um, uh, inability to render this or know how to render it. Uh, the cloud the cloud is my favorite part of this painting. It's, it's amazing. As a sort of Icon, the how much weight it's bearing inadvertently in the, in the uh, image. Amidst this image, uh, indecision, Giotto places the ascending Christ up against the end of the pictorial frame and allows his hands, but not his halo, to uh, just to break the frame. And that's very interesting to me, to the extent that it achieves a kind of apophatic modesty in this image. For Giotto, where is Christ, the ascended Christ, out of our visual frame, and that's about all we can say about it, I think, here. So, uh, there's a sort of single spatial um, a paradigm here, uh, and, and so uh, when, that, when that happens, then what, what does one do with the ascension of Christ, the ascended body of Christ? I think it's a particular uh, problem in the West, as I said. Um, subsequent artists tried various other solutions that produce even further ambiguities, I think. Here's Mantegna, who we, we have a sort of uh, floating body on a, di on a different quality of cloud than the others in the sky, and surrounded by cherubim, red, and blue. But there's a, a, an intense sort of spatial ambiguity, uh, indecision about it. Uh, other artists have addressed the uh, a problem by breaking the continuous pictorial space to reveal another space behind or above it, creating a kind of portal through which Jesus passes. Uh, in, in, in this case, <laughs> um, um, there's a sort of opening of the sky or tearing of the sky. So it's a, it's a it's an up into the atmosphere, into the into the sky, but also into an else an elsewhere. But it's visualized and spatialized in a way that creates all sorts of I think problems. Others have tried to have it both ways, uh, allowing the cloud formations to be ambiguously naturalistic or heavenly. In this, in this instance. In more recent examples, digital technologies mix with a kind of quantum physics mysticism to render the elsewhere of Christ's ascension 
I'm not sure these are promising routes to pursue, but they're, um, it's, it, it's worth thinking through them, what kind of spatialities, spatial assumptions are involved here. Indeed, I think there is, as I've said, a pervasive phenomenon of disappointing, deeply ambivalent images of the ascension. But these ambivalences are helpful in the ways that they bring particular spatial assumptions to the surface, and with them some of our deeper imaginative problems, and exegetical problems, theological problems. In one sense, the spatiality of the visual arts produces the problem here. Um, but uh, some such spatialities are in play for all of us uh, um, readers, whether we're making images or not, looking at images or not. And so these images are helpful in the ways that they bring uh, some of that to the, to the surface. Um, the problem here with a lot of these images was articulated most crudely by the famous astrophysicist Carl Sagan. Quote, he said this, if Jesus were caught up at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, with what we know today about the vastness of our galaxy, Jesus would still be traveling today just to reach the outer limits of the Milky Way, because 2,000 light years isn't very far in cosmic terms. <laughs> and of course, he adds, there are billions and billions of galaxies beyond the uh, Milky Way. So what are we do? What are we thinking? about the ascension if we're thinking in spatial terms, visual spatial terms. Um, I think Sagan's is an extremely pedantic observation, but it efficiently poses the relevant questions of what we mean by ascension, if not this. What does lifted up mean? Where is Jesus? John of Damascus rightly says that, quote, we do not hold that the right hand of the Father is an actual place, end quote. But as Douglas Farrow, and John of Damascus for that matter, reminds us, Jesus remains who and what he is, a specific embodied human, quote, to whom God affords time and space whose bodily return we await. He must therefore have a place, end quote. Okay, you see the problem. Let's sort of set up here. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I think the history of Christian art offers um, other richer ways of understanding this that uh, 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 might, might offer some alternatives. And so we're going to explore just a, a few other um, alternatives. Um, the lower portion, this is a, a very old ivory uh, from right around 400 AD from either Rome or Milan, somewhere in the Italian peninsula. Um, in, in which the lower portion depicts a, a kind of hybrid of Matthew's and Mark's accounts of the resurrection, depicting the three women from Mark 16 arriving at the tomb of Jesus, where they're addressed by an angel who's sitting on the stone he had rolled away from the tomb, from Matthew 28. And he says, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he has said. Come and see the place where he lay. End quote. Interestingly, the tomb of Christ is not depicted as an opening with the stone rolled away. Rather, it's a realistic depiction of the Anastasis Rotunda in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, which was built in about 335 AD, more than three centuries after the resurrection of Christ. And that's an uh, evocative artistic decision. Uh, as if to emphasize the historical particularity of this burial place as it extends into the artist's present, whereby we hear we are to hear the, an, the, the angel's words in the present tense, come and see the place where he lay, um, i.e. you, the viewer, can go here. <laughs> right. And this is what you'll see, the, the uh, rotunda. The sepulcher rises up behind the angel, flanked on either side by two guards who are, quote, so afraid of the angel that they shook and became like dead men. The top portion uh, includes some of the deepest carving in the panel with an empty archway through which we're to see, we see all the way back to the sky behind, as if to symbolically render the sepulcher as empty even though the doors are closed. And out of the sepulchre grows a great olive tree, suggestive uh, perhaps of the church of 
new creation and or the tree of life that is rooted in and growing from the resurrection. Our particular interest here, however, is the scene in the upper right, where the ascension of Christ is depicted as though he's hiking up a mountain. At the top of uh, which, I, I suppose you could, some people see it as sort of cloud, but it's the same carving for all of the ground. I think it is a, a, clearly a mountain that Jesus is, his, his feet are hiking up uh, in the same way that the uh, uh, disciples and everyone else is standing on this uh, ground. At the top of this mountain is a heavy cloud from which a hand emerges grasping Jesus' right hand and presumably pulling him into the cloud. In a somewhat whimsical way, this gesture preserves the passive tone in Luke's and Mark's phrasing. He was taken up, not only to, but by the right hand of God. This is a highly unusual and evocative depiction of the ascension for multiple reasons. Uh, first, the ascension up the mountainside seems to insist, more strongly than anything we've seen so far, that Christ was taken up bodily. There is no levitating body here, uh, in other words. Second, the artist's decision to render the ascension into heaven as an ascent up a mountain is evocative not of Luke Acts, the Luke Acts account, which makes no mention of a mountain. Um, maybe there's a mountain in Matthew, but uh, rather the mountain seems to be a constructive decision by the artist to imaginatively and exegetically link Christ's ascension to the right hand of the Father with Moses' ascent up Mount Sinai into a dark cloud that covered the mountain, within which dwelled the devouring fire of the Shekinah glory of God's presence. This reworks our understanding of what it means in Acts that a cloud hid him from their sight, uh, whereby the hiddenness of Christ is here understood in terms not of, kind of cumulus cloud formations, but of the dark glory cloud of God and uh, the dark glory cloud where God is. And the artist isn't venturing out alone here. Uh, in making this connection. Hebrews 12 makes this link between Christ and Sinai in highly imagistic ways. So too, Gregory of Nyssa, who was writing just prior to uh, the carving of this panel, characterizes Moses' ascent uh, to the top of Sinai as an ascent to where he sees the heavenly tabernacle not made with human hands, which he then immediately, and this is in the life of Moses, which he then immediately identifies as Christ, who is, who is the power and the wisdom of God, whose name is tabernacle and whose flesh is the tabernacle um, uh, curtain. So for Nyssa, um, uh, 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 Moses' ascent up uh, to Sinai is an encounter with the, tabern the heavenly tabernacle who is Christ. And just in, case, just in case it feels like my reading of this image in Sinai terms feels like a stretch, fascinatingly, we have several later artworks. Here's an 11th century um, Byzantine illuminated manuscript, which adopts this exact same compositional structure to depict Moses receiving the law on Sinai. Interestingly, we don't have any of these of the Moses compositions prior to this, none that survive. Um, which is, which is interesting, it, it uh, perhaps uh, suggests that it's later artists, theologians, who are making the intertextual reference explicit by reinterpreting the ascension back into Sinai. However, we understand this, there's a, a, a clear compositional uh, similarity. And here it sets up several fascinating uh, comparisons. Whereas Moses instructs Israel uh, in the covenant on the, in the bottom lower right, uh, the angel proclaims the resurrection. Whereas Moses removes his sandals before the burning bush, and interestingly, the bush itself is not depicted, uh, uh, at least not clearly, or maybe it's been uh, taken out. I, um, uh, but where, uh, where Moses removes his sandals before the burning bush, Jesus' empty tomb grows the eschatological olive tree. Where Moses receives the law, Jesus ascends with the scroll, whether we interpret that as an emblem of the logos 
of having all authority in heaven and earth uh, or, or an eschatological scroll, he, is, he ascends, uh, Moses receives the law, Jesus ascends with the word, with the scroll. So in this rendering of the ascension, where is Christ? He ascended creation Sinai into the dark glory cloud, into the tabernacle where God is. And of course, then this also becomes strongly elusive to Christ's return. As with Moses, ascent is followed by descent. Moses returns with the law and a plan for the earthly tabernacle, whereas Jesus returns to render all the earth as a single tabernacle. We also have an implication here of the giving of the Spirit. Moses returns with the law. Uh, Jesus gives the Spirit. Okay, so that's a first case study that kind of, as a spatial device, reorganizes the ways that we understand ascension um, in ways that resist its own visual spatiality, really. Uh, a second uh, case study. Uh, this 6th century Syrian illuminated manuscript packs numerous biblical allusions together in order to portray Christ's ascension. Here Christ ascends not simply into the sky, but into a deep blue sapphire oval, or with Ezekiel in mind, uh, I should say a deep blue throne uh, encircled by a rainbow, uh, which... Um, uh, I, I think, directly alludes to Ezekiel 1. Indeed, Ezekiel is exactly who we should have in mind here. Angels on either side bring crowns, and uh, near the center of the image, immediately below Christ, <clears throat> we get a striking depiction of the mysterious four living beings who surround the throne of God in Ezekiel's visions, each with the faces of a man, lion, ox, and eagle, and accompanied by a wheel within a wheel, which you see there, and radiating flame. <clears throat> and these beings then reappear in a slightly different form in Revelation, and in multiple uh, places in Revelation. So what does it mean to read the Ascension through Ezekiel 1? Spatially, it does something different than the Sinai motif, uh, specifically emphasizing divine enthronement here rather than divine glory cloud or tabernacle. By synthesizing the ascension of Jesus described in Luke Acts with the apocalyptic visions of Ezekiel and uh, Revelation, this image theologically interprets the ascension less as Christ lifting off from the earth into the sky than as his being taken up into the throne of God, inhabiting the, the position, or as Irenaeus would have it, um, not at, but as the right hand of the, pow the power of God. As, uh, and that's a quote from several biblical passages. The heavenly bodies of the sun and the moon attend this event, and they're in the upper corners there. Um, but they do not in any sense circumscribe where Christ is or give us any coordinates for discerning this position. In other words, I, I think by, by uh, including Ezekiel, uh, these Ezekiel references, the sun and the moon as a spatial container, right, uh, as a visual spatial container, are um, uh, interrupted. They don't contain uh, uh, the ascension. So we get a position that is not that we cannot position. We cannot locate, so to speak. Uh, and this is precisely the position from which he has all authority over the church and the world, uh, from which he's currently present to the world through the Spirit, and from uh, which he will again return to initiate marriage of heaven and earth. So kind of apophatic move, I think, here in a compositional position that is not is not placeable, so to speak, at least by us. <clears throat> of course, the outpouring of the Spirit in Pentecost is also strongly implied here, not only biblically, but visually. This is the same compositional structure that traditionally undergirds depictions of Pentecost and the eschatological return of uh, and judgment of Christ. 
Indeed, this common visual structure gives us important tools for understanding our topic here without overly concretizing it. Artistically speaking, we can say that the ascension places Christ in the pictorial compositional position from which the Spirit is poured out and from which Christ alone has authority to judge the earth. Um, uh, in which he has a, a authority to judge the earth. In the Acts account, suddenly two men in white robes appeared uh, with the disciples assuring them, this Jesus who has been taken up uh, from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. So two images of Jesus' ascension and return are depicted in the same way and mutually imply each other. So this, I mean, these, uh, if you, when you do get return images, they look very much like this. It's the same compositional structure. I think there's also allusion to Pentecost in the hand uh, hanging down from Ezekiel's four living beings that gives, will give. In fact, we'll, we see that in a lot of uh, Pentecost images, the hand that gives. It's important to note that these last two images do not depict what Christ's ascension looked like as a historical event, but what it means as a historical event. For example, while P Peter is depicted prominently next to the angel on the right, Paul is portrayed next to the angel on the left, even though the ascension occurred years before his conversion. This is not due to sloppy reading on the part of the artist. It is part of a claim about the meaning of the ascension in relation to the ongoing life of the church, universal in its mission, uh, his, its ministry both to the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, for instance. For similar reasons, Mary is given massive importance here, uh, not merely as a historical person, but as, but as a kind of archetypal image of the church itself, just as she says yes to the overshadowing of the Spirit, and Christ is born into the world, tabernacling with us in uh, flesh, so too the church must continually say yes to the overshadowing of the Spirit and be the body of Christ in the world. Um, this is more, even more emphatically articulated in the 6th century Egyptian um, apse fresco, um, uh, in which you have the Ezekiel's throne, you have the four living creatures, the wheels within the wheels, the ascended Christ as uh, 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 in the uh, center of the throne of God, and specifically here rendered as a seat of wisdom. That is not just a throne, but it's a seat of wisdom that um, uh, he's placed on. And below it is placed the uh, mother and child at the center of the church, the incarnation, uh, son, of, son of God, born of a woman, at the center of the church. Not to depict two separate Christs, but sort of two perspectives. The ascended one is the incarnate one. The incarnate one at the center of the church is also the one in whom the whole church holds together, and so on. Um, uh, so, all to say, this is a visual exegesis of Luke-Acts in the sense that it's offering a visual reading of the text, but it's also doing quite a lot more than that, making a series of constructive theological moves by re reading the passage intertextually and proposing what the ascension means, reading it intertextually with Ezekiel, with um, uh, Exodus uh, prior, prior to that. Okay. Um, I want to look at two more images that give two, each of these is sort of rotating the way that we understand uh, the spatiality of the ascension, or the, spati the spatial frameworks that we use to uh, understand the uh, ascension, putting all of them under pressure, I think. The visual structure of the Rabula image, which is the one with the um, Ezekiel, the throne of Ezekiel, would become compositionally dominant in the East and would undergo uh, various other uh, innovations. So this just this same composition, compositional structure just runs through centuries of Eastern Christian art. Fundamental to all of them is the notion that the ascension here doesn't have much to do with the higher part of the atmosphere, which Western images are continually struggling with, but with an entirely different kind of space. 
The relevant coordinates here are not down and up or even higher and lower, but earth and heaven, old creation and new creation. In this icon by the great uh, Andrei Rublev, this is efficiently depicted through, a ba through really basic compositional orders and structures. First, by creating a, a disjunction in scale between Christ and the apostles. Christ ascends uh, bodily, but there's no single continuous spatial framework that includes both of them. Or if there is, it's a kind of heuristic, uh, the, the, the heuristic of having to put it all on one panel. But there's purposefully a spatial break uh, 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 in terms of scale. But there's also a break in, in terms of fundamental uh, uh, shapes, compositional shapes, square space-time versus circular space-time. Um, square space-time, which has grid-based coordinates, um, that's why this, the square is often associated with the earth and earthliness, versus circular space-time, which pivots eternally around an ineffable center, which in the East is often depicted as a blackness. There's a center of that circle is ineffable darkness, dark, the luminous darkness of God. Um, in, his, in his book, uh, Ascension Theology, Douglas Farrow argues that the ascension of Christ, quote, does entail admission to an already existing place, but the, uh, does not I'm sorry, this is crucial, does not entail admission to an already existing place, but the creation of a new one. This entails the creation of a new time and place and mode of light. Not ex nihilo, but ex vetere, out of old. Is this not what the saving right hand of God is committed to doing? Uh, end quote. And uh, for this reason, and I want to quote uh, Pharaoh a, a bit of length because I think it's helpful in relation to Rublev. This is Pharaoh, a uh, quote, the place to which Jesus goes in his ascension, the there and the then of the life which he lives at the Father's right hand as founder of the new Jerusalem is really a place, yet it is not one to which we can refer on our own terms, cosmological or otherwise. It is not somewhere in this world a Lebensraum or a living space, a habitat that's attainable by political or technological conquest, which is what the German notion of Lebensraum <laughs> was. Nor yet is it somewhere in addition to this world, an outside to which one escapes. Rather, it exists by virtue of the transformation or reconstitution of this world in the spirit. Hence, it can be referred to only indirectly, which is to say, from the place and time in which we ourselves remain, it can be recognized only by faith and can be touched only sacramentally, he argues. It will hardly do, then, to think about the place which Jesus occupies in his ascension as a distant place, whether spatially or temporally. All that can be said about it is that the time and place which Jesus occupies are those in which and by way of which God's sovereign act of recreation is extended through him to all times and places, end quote from Pharaoh. And this seems to be precisely and I think profoundly what Rublev's image is working to visually conceive. But his solution still has a strong propensity toward visually placing Christ somewhere in addition to this world and outside, to use Pharaoh's phrase. Uh, and so can this be addressed visually? As a, as a, um, just to uh, move by it real quickly for sake of time, um, we could compare it to this, uh, the uh, British artist Rebecca um, Orban, uh, who uh, m maybe um, uh, has, has one alternative to this, including the, uh, not only um, creating a spatial disjunction in scale, even more dramatic than Rublev did, and oppositely so, um, but placing all of it within the oval uh, in which the, the earth is a kind of... Uh, a small, uh, a small section, a small portion within the presence of Christ. That's an interesting proposal. 
Okay, I want to look at one last one that I think pulls a lot of this together and, and makes a, a pretty interesting um, kind of uh, spatial, mm, uh, not proposal, but uh, suggestion. Uh, and, and I want to turn to this, a, a, a Greek church, 11th century Greek church or monastery. Further understandings are possible if we pursue this inquiry not only within vis the visual space of paintings, but also in the architectural space of a church, which, especially in the Orthodox tradition, is meant to function as a kind of three-dimensional icon. This possibility of being inside the icon creates remarkable possibilities for thinking the ascension as the time and place from which, again, to, borrow's, to borrow Pharaoh's term, God's sovereign act of recreation is extended through him to all times and places. So here in this 11th century Greek church, the relation between square and circle in Rublev's icon becomes not merely pictorial, but also the very space that we inhabit as the church or in the church. The floor of the church is um, a series of squares within squares whereas the ceiling is composed of circles and arches. The central dome depicts the ascension in which Christ Pentocrator occupies the highest place in the church, enthroned in a circle within circles. Uh, um, and interestingly, it's highly probable that that dome is meant to act as a kind of glory cloud. Once the church gets filled with incense um, and light, uh, breaks in through the windows that are at the base of the dome, you have this luminous cloud through which you see the dark figure of Christ uh, as, as the glory cloud. There's, in a lot of these churches, they actually put mirrors on the window sills, the top of the, mirror, the window sills, so that the sun would reflect up into this cloud or into this dome. Okay. Such architecture is built from the ground up, and in one sense, it can be read from the ground up, everything culminating in this highest image. The ascended Christ is, as Colossians 1 says, the head of the church and the one through whom all things are made and in whom all things hold together. And this is kind of a spatial example of that or um, model of that. But in another sense, all churches like this one are to be read from the top down with all of space and history and revelation proceeding from him, throat uh, flowing through time, through the narratives, through the figures. And we in the present are on the ground floor. So church, church time unfolds downward, <laughs> so to speak. And furthering this double movement of a, a upward reading and downward reading, Christ ascends to the highest point from which the Spirit is poured out. Perhaps this example subtly, subtly corrects the potential problem of outsideness we noted in Rublev. I've already mentioned the squareness of the earth. Uh, on the floor and the circularity of Christ's throne, but importantly, there are at least two other intermediary shapes held between and within these shapes. The square of the church's base is organized into a Greek cross, which sh thus shapes the earthly church into the cruciform body of Christ. So to be on the floor is to be shaped into, into a cross, into a cruciform body. High above the circular dome, uh, as, so high above the floor then, this circular dome then rests on, um, oh, I'm sorry, the, the circular dome rests on this cruciform shape of the church, and it does so through an octagon. So how do you get circle and cross to meet? Uh, octagon is the solution. In traditional uh, church architecture, an eight-sided space symbolizes the eschatological eighth day, beyond the seventh day creation we are in. And this is why traditionally baptismal fonts are eight-sided. You're baptized into the eighth day, the eschatological eighth day. The day of the resurrection, cosmic re uh, resurrection. 
In other words, from our square plane, cruciform square plane, our vision into the circle of Christ's eternal presence as the right hand of God is eschatological vision. Square within cross, within octagon, within circle. Or maybe we say that the other way around. <laughs> Again, to reiterate that, uh, both, both directionalities. All things, all times, uh, hold together in him. To be in Christ is to be in uh, a way that telescopes one's life now through all spatio-temporal shapes which hold together in Christ. That's a kind of metaphorical spatiality that is really evocative to me, I think. That's the, this square life, uh, grid space life, telescopes through all the spatio-temporal shapes that hold together in Christ. The octagon as well as the cross, the square as well as the circle. So here in the a visual theological space of the church in which incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and eschatological culmination are co-adhering in these shapes, we might hear St. Paul just slightly later in Colossians saying, set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. If you hear that in the context of this church, it, uh, while standing in this church, um, setting your hearts on things above doesn't mean abandoning your uh, body or abandoning the below, because all the shapes hold together in Okay, so uh, that's a really interesting series of uh, uh, um, solutions, alternatives to uh, the, these spatial understandings of the ascension. So in closing, I just want to uh, go back to those initial suggestions I made at the beginning of the talk, um, taking stock of, of the kind of visual theological and visual exegetical um, uh, possibilities that uh, kind of reasonings, reworkings that we've seen in these ascension images. Uh, first, I think these images do uh, generate heightened sensitivity to the visuality, visual details of the biblical text. That could be emphasized more than I've done here, but uh, uh, we chose to go for these second two, uh, emphasize these second two even more so, which include intertextual reading, something about visual spatial images um, facilitating intertextual readings in um, productive ways. Reading Acts 1, for instance, through or in relation to Ezekiel 1 and 10, Revelation 4, Exodus 24, Colossians 1, and so on. Um, and then lastly, uh, I think we also have seen, particularly in the plurality of these images, the plurality of these uh, um, spatial models, a kind of critical testing and constructive reworking of the visual spatial understandings that are sort of default for me, or that uh, I, I, I might bring to reading uh, uh, or thinking about the, un, uh, the ascension uncritically or unconsciously. Um, and all of this, I think, uh, should uh, not culminate in the images, but send us back to the text with new questions. Uh, um, sensitivities. Okay, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, and I ran on a little long, but uh, I, I'm happy to uh, talk, ask questions. If you need to go, by all means do so, but if, if you have any questions or want to uh, chat, um, I'm happy to stick around and do so. Yes, Christina. Yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for this, as well as your um, your time the last three years. It's been so wonderful having you, and I know we've all really benefited from that. So thank you, thank you so that. much. Thank you. Um, one thing that was brought to my mind when thinking, first of all, I just love the idea of um, images testing our preconceived notions about the visuality that we bring to the text. And one thing that this has brought to my mind is the ways that I have always imagined Jesus's wounds um, at the Ascension too. Oh, oh. And I think one thing I loved about the final um, 
image of the church in particular is it brought into this context, the cross, um, which maybe uh, the crucifixion, the wounds, those things weren't necessarily as present in the other images. Yeah. And I wonder if in your research you've run across um, imaginative or creative ways that the uh, um, the woundedness of Christ's risen body is present, um, such that the ascension is thereby like inextricably connected to the crucifixion. Ooh. Yeah, good. The, for the sake of the recording and, and the Zoom, uh, the, the question is about the, um, the present, the last image uh, incorporated the cross, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus, but not so much the images before that. So uh, are, where, um, uh, where in the images are uh, uh, the wounded resurrection body of Christ in ascension? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. I mean, I interestingly, I, my first impulse is to say that those Western images that I was kind of picking on um, at the beginning is is where you will get much more emphasis on the the woundedness of the risen Christ. So it's a it's the body of Christ lifted up, and it's often conspicuously wounded one right. that cry and not so much the ones that I showed but some of the others Christ will be raising his hands in the ascension not just to uh, not just upward but showing the wounds and showing the the side, the side. Um, so there, there'd be a number of um, examples there um, what would be a would be a uh, yeah I, I mean that's maybe the, maybe the first place I would I would go for that I mean that's kind of that's kind of interesting as well that you have the kind of um, some of the spatial ambiguities in those images because they insist on all of the bodies occupying a single spatial frame that's not always true of Western images but often um, but Come, coming with that is often an emphasis on the physicality of the body, right? That's not to say Eastern images don't do that, but it's kind of difference of, of emphasis. I don't know. Does anything come to mind for you that you'd, you'd add? <laughs> um, well, I just was wondering, like, what my imagination was when I was reading those passages, even thinking about Thomas, you know, touching the wounds. What, did, what do I imagine the wounds look like? What do I imagine that body looks like? What yeah. do I imagine an ascending wounded body looks like. And I wonder even if maybe just a cruciformity of the figure too yeah. as it is ascended or something like that's, that. That's that's really interesting. But man, I love I love what the church does. That it's it like the the dome of the ascended space is grounded within the cross of the earthly space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. There's this one doesn't so much emphasize the crucifixion the, the woundedness of Christ, maybe the uh, in a, in a manuscript that also has crucifixion images, maybe an allusion to the uh, cruciform uh -huh. uh, body of Christ. Uh -huh. But interestingly, with Ethiopian images, and this isn't directly related to what you're asking, but it, it, it is related. Um, interestingly, with a lot of Ethiopian uh, images of the ascension, they're often put in... Um, they often depict Christ not just in um, kind of r glorious robes or kingly robes, but priestly robes. This one does this a little it's like bit. Quran, yeah, that's right. The, but there's a there's a, a, a church, one of the famous Lalibela uh, churches in Ethiopia, where they have an image of the um, of Adam and Eve before the fall clothed in priestly robes, which is a really interesting suggestion. Uh, so they're clothed before the fall in, uh, in uh, priestly robes, and after the fall they are naked, which is a sort of flip uh, from the biblical text, but it's an intelligent, it's a theologically intelligent one. And then when you get images of the, in the same church, of the Anastasis, Christ raising Adam and Eve, they are naked and he's wearing the priestly robes. Oh, so good. Uh, the very, very similar, sort of transfigured uh, priestly robes of Adam. And then that then carries into the ascension. So you don't really have 
the crucifixion or the wounded body of Christ emphasized there, but you have the priestliness of Christ that I think is is part of that. You know, the the um, the the priest who is the uh, lamb mm -hmm. sacrifice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Ross. Jonathan, thanks so much. Um, on this last point, actually, Second Temple Jewish and then rabbinic traditions depict Adam as priest in Ah, oh, okay, uh, lovely. So they're certainly in conversation with some of these texts. And, yeah, lovely. Um, I, I wondered if you reflect a little bit more. I, I, I love the, the trajectory of, of your talk. When you got to the Rublev icon, you, you sort of said, not spatial, but. But I'm, I still notice, though, that in the icon, Christ is at the top. In the construction of the church, it's the highest dome. Yeah. I, I wonder if in the grammar, if there still is something about up and down that's yeah. crucial, even if it's not in the same plane. Yeah. It's something about the human bodily experience of, of yeah. awe or something. Would, would you yes. reflect on that a little yes, bit? Yes, that's really interesting. So the question is about uh, whether whether there's... Even if we're kind of breaking a single spatial paradigm here, there's still always Christ at the top, Christ in, in the dome, Christ at the top of the image. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it just is the uh, all of our thinking and, and our doctrines on, uh, regarding the ascension um, and our biblical texts are just in, uh, um, unavoidably and productively spatial. So there's this kind of... I think a kind of built-in um, sort of tension between needing to say uh, Christ was taken up. Um, uh, there is an there is an ascension here. There's an upward movement. You need to think it in those terms, but you're probably not thinking it very well, <laughs> right? Or something. Maybe that's maybe that's too flippant. Um, be careful, be cautious about what you assume up means, taken up means, or um, ascension means. Uh, so there's, there's maybe a, um, I don't know, to, to, borrow, to borrow a line from uh, Dionysius the Areopagite, there's a, um, an, an assertion and a retracing of that same assertion. Something, something along those lines. I don't know, what do you think about that? Is that... But you don't... But you don't, the, we must retain the upwardness and the, ascend, the ascendedness of Christ it's to the throne of God. Though I, I don't quite know what that, once I start concretizing that or spatializing that, uh, I should be conscious or con, uh, 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 cautious. Um, but, but, that's, um, but that has to be retained. Something, something along those lines. I don't know. Is that okay? I think so. I mean, I, I suppose you could go. It's, it's our bodily experience is that we're grounded. Yeah. And, and so the notion of up and down is built into what it is to be human. I, I yeah. even Carl Sagan. I mean, as infantile as his yeah. observation is, there's an out. I mean, yeah. there's no up or down in space, but for us, there is an up because yeah. we're. We're not other than that's right. located creatures. That's right, and that's that's gift, and the, that those are the that is that is our um, um, that is fundamental to our relatedness to God and to each other, and to uh, so we should think in those terms. But uh, uh, we don't get our hands around it, so, so, so to speak, <laughs> something like that. You think think this as a creature. But think it as a creature. Maybe that's. Uh, think it as an earthling. But think it as an earthling. Remember, you're thinking as an earthling. Something, something like that. Yeah. Other conversations over about what happens with the texts and the creeds about hell, and I'm Ooh. I'd be interested in hearing. You know, maybe your first thoughts on, on, on thinking about that version or that how, how some of your reasoning here might apply to some of those depictions. The problem in that discussion was very much a spatial reasoning. Totally. And uh, the, the, the kind of conflict, like how does this happen and where did, 
Jesus go and like why you know and uh, it created all sorts of problems that I'd, I'd love to have had this lecture to begin uh, yeah. parsing out but yeah could you yeah. Do lecture number two on that wonder <laughs> yes yes there is a lecture on this uh, um, Oh, that's a wonderful question. The question is about, uh, so what are the implications here? How does this sort of uh, um, complement or connect to the uh, descent into hell? Is there a similar kind of uh, set of problems and possibilities? Absolutely. Um, I think the, um, the descent into hell, the, the images of the descent into hell or the harrowing of hell or... or um, that whole cluster of kind of images um, is a, precisely a, a place where we see um, a, a lot of intertextual reasoning going on and a lot of testing of the spatial models that we use to conceptualize that. The, the intertextual readings are particularly interesting, I think. The, I think the most productive descent into hell images are subtly, but I think I think um, persuasively, Exodus images. So there is a descent into the uh, the bot all the way to the bottom of things, the bottom of the sea, the into the chaos waters, um, and there is a sort of parting in a lot of those images. There's a parting of the of the hellscape, I don't know, the, 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 the shale space, um, a parting, and then a liberation. So he, he grabs, in a lot of these images, Adam and Eve and yanks them out of their grave. And if he's yanking Adam and Eve out of their grave, then all, the, the whole, you know, it's, it's totally open-ended how many people follow. If Adam and Eve come out, then... Uh, all, all who are in Adam, potentially, uh, or certainly all who are in second Adam. And so it is, I, it, it, they are liberation images or exodus images. So that performs a similar kind of thing as like the Sinai, mapping ascension onto Sinai. Is, oh, I, you know, I, I might understand the ascension in terms of Christ going into the glory cloud, the tabernacle where God is. I don't know what that means spatially, but I know what it means theologically, right? Similarly, with the descent into hell, there's, there is a, there is a, I, I don't know what it means spatially or even temporally, but I know what it means theologically to say uh, the descent into hell, the harrowing of hell is a, um, is an, an exodus through the sea, the Dead Sea. Kind of the, the sea of the sea of death uh, through the through the the powers of um, sh shale or the devil or the the chaos man monster. What's the chaos? Apophis or uh, I don't know <laughs> the 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 Egyptian uh, uh, ruler of the sea that the that the Israelites go through and overcome, God overcomes them. So anyway, I think there's something really similar and really theologically productive that happens in the uh, descent into hell images there. Well, and, it's an invitation for next year. You yeah, can work yeah. That out. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll work it out. Yeah. <laughs> descent side of this. Yeah, it's lovely, yeah. Similarly, with descent of the spirit, by the way, ascent to descent, you have these going all the way through, and we, they, we just do have intrinsically spatial language that does these, that we need to work with, but they're, you know, the working them is important. Yeah, uh, yeah there was a... On the kind of spatial up and down way of thinking about the ascension, which we've seen is very tricky, and Pharaoh has a really good way of talking about up and down being a kind of a concession of speech um, for a kind of intimate yes. creation. But there's a really fascinating um, scene in, it's interesting that it, you've, we see in this that it's kind of in the late medieval period where the motion and the upwardness becomes really stretched, sorry, stressed. There's a scene in, in Julian of Norwich um, in her revelation where it's the end of, <clears throat> the very end of, book uh, chapter 51 the uh, parable of the <clears throat> servant and she gets a glimpse of the ascension and she does something really remarkable 
like in light of, of this conversation, she says that I saw Christ sitting next to the right hand of the Father, but then she has this aside, and she says, we are not su to suppose that Christ was n to the next next to the Father like you, someone can be yes. next to someone in, in yes. this life. And then she says, I saw no such sitting in the Trinity. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so, I, I, so that's yes. obviously something that is really tricky with visual art. Yes. But Julian is really aware of this. Yes. Um, and so she lets us know that we can't imagine Christ next to it. Like I can put my bottle next to me. Yes. Um, no such sitting in the Trinity. Yes. Um, oh. Uh, yeah, so I think yes, good, she's good. really helpful. Um, uh, for sake of uh, Janet Soskis, who's listening in, the, the question is about uh, Julian of Norwich and her vision of the Trinity, uh, that uh, in which she says that the um, she she saw Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father, but I saw no such sitting in the sense of a next to. Yeah. There isn't a next to in the Trinity. Yeah, that's uh, it's a great it's a great point of reference. Um, and I think that's that's exactly that's exactly right um, in in terms of what well, so so one of the dangers of uh, the visual images I I think uh, with, in a lot of in a lot of these um, with regard to a lot of these doctrines is that they can sort of structure our imagination to predispose us toward thinking of the next two to thinking in highly concrete terms about, highly concrete spatialized terms about the Trinity or the Ascension or what have you. Um, and I mean, you know, images of the Trinity, for instance, are um, super fraught and problematic and uh, um, have, have uh, I think, created all sorts of problems. But there, there is... Um, there is a, there's a, a kind of um, uh, something analogous to Julian. I mean, Julian is instructive there in the ways that she both sees and doesn't see it, uh, see, sees and unsees it. And maybe, maybe it's um, it, uh, writing that down functions differently spatially than making an image. But I think in, in the history of images, image making in the church, there's still this pretty strong um, notion that the image gives something and withholds the same thing in, in terms of it spatializes it, but it doesn't. Um, the next two, maybe I'll say it here in, the, in this way, the next two that I'm proposing in this image is a heuristic next two. It's a provisional next two. It's a next to that I don't really understand. I don't fully understand it in the image. If that makes any sense. The uh, Rublev's image of the Trinity, for instance, I think uh, is, is a sort of brilliant example where he gives us three figures, the three visitors at Mamre, um, but also, and so you get the threeness of the Trinity that is really quite productive visually, theologically, but also withholds that as a as a uh, concept that we can c concretize the perspective for instance inverts and we don't know where we're standing anymore and we don't know this something along those lines I don't know and I think I think maybe the plurality of the images is helpful for me in the ways that the more we get I mean maybe it would be sort of helpful to not have any images of some of these things but that's we're too late for that. And so the plurality of, of them is actually potentially really helpful in the ways that they enlarge and critique each other and, and loosen, lo loosen some of the overly concretized ways that we may be in. Is that, is that, is that good? Is that good? The uh, Julian reference is a great, a great one. I hadn't thought of it. Yeah. Yeah. One more question and then we'll... Maybe well, one more. Yeah, it's really in. just up to those in the room. Yeah, okay. I need to leave. Yes. Uh, but, um, I don't want to. You're here to do this. To so have discussions like this and keep going until somebody kicks you out. I think there's room here, but yeah, people can feel free to leave. So. Thanks so much, Thank Dan. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And yeah, keep going. Yeah.
Um, my question is about the resurrection. Ooh. Sort of a lecture three introduction Ooh. for you. Um, <laughs> I've been looking a lot at images of the resurrection, and they have a lot of very similar problems yes. to images of the ascension, with yes. people yelling about, like, oh, he's floating on the clouds, put him back on the ground. And yes. even the Council of Trent was like, if you're painting the resurrection, like, put him on the ground. Yeah. And mm. I'm just interested because I note that a lot of your successful ascension images are from the Orthodox Church. Uh -huh. And the Orthodox Church, if I'm correct, prohibits depicting the majesty of the resurrection. That's, that's, yeah. And, yeah, I just wonder if you can speak Ooh. to that. <laughs> Yes, interesting. The, the question is about depictions of the resurrection and the observation that in the Eastern traditions that I kind of highlighted at the end. Um, uh, and uh, by the way, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, advocating that you settle in the East or so, resettle your, your, uh, your the theology in the East. Uh, it, this is a very ecumenical uh, kind of uh, talk. Um, uh, but the, the observation that in the East, in Eastern images, there's no depictions of the resurrection. The moment of resurrection, there aren't depictions of that. That's true. That's interesting. The, 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 res, the way they depict the resurrection in, um, in Orthodox traditions is in the form of the descent into hell, which they refer to as the anastasis or the raising up. Uh, so in a lot of those images, at the top will be anastasis, anastasis raising. Um, and that is, that is the, it's the raising of Adam and Eve um, that we get to see uh, with the implication that in raising Adam and Eve, pulling them out of the grave, uh, then Christ raises uh, himself. I mean, he, God raises Christ. The Father raises Christ um, uh, with Adam and Eve, um, but they don't depict that. Uh, perhaps we we say that the uh, all icons of Christ um, in in uh, Eastern traditions are of the risen Christ, um, but they're not the moments of resurrection itself. And that's a really interesting. That's a really interesting um, idea that that is the kind of unpicturable moment. They're, they're willing to depict the ascension, the ascended Christ, the pentocrator, uh, willing to depict the transfiguration. Um, uh, so they depict all of these things, and those are all points of reference references for the moment of resurrection, but... Uh, there, there aren't uh, depictions of the resurrection, as far as I know. In maybe, in maybe you get some of that in um, some Eastern churches. Maybe the Cop the Coptic Church does that occasionally, but for the most part, Greek Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. I yeah, I'm not aware of any moments of uh, images of the resurrection. Um, but it's implicit in every in all image making. Maybe that's a way of understanding it. All image making in, in the East is founded on the incarnation and resurrection of Jesus. Something interesting about all of the images witnessing to it without an, Im an image that specifically represents it. I don't know. How, as far as the West, yeah, the, you do have similar kind of issues. Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's productive that you have... Like the Council of Trent saying, if you're going to depict the resurrection, you got to put Christ's feet on the ground, not on clouds or something. Um, not already uh, up in the air. This is a physical body. So there might be something really interesting there to think through further. There might also be a kind of, that might signal that we're a sort of um, already, we're already assuming a, coherent enclosed spatial frame that, well, you're supposed to do it this way or that way within that frame rather than maybe uh, testing the frame itself. I don't know. I'll have to think more about that, images of the resurrection. It's, what, it's not an image that, we, that I treat in my class on this, which is interesting. We do descended to hell, ascension, Pentecost, all these things, but 
not the images of the resurrection itself. Yeah. I don't know. Anything you want to say more about that or further ideas? No, I feel like it just overlaps a lot with what the yeah. problems of the ascension totally. are. You know, it's this spatio-temporal thing of like Christ being, it's a way of being that has been transformed. It's very hard to like paint yes. whatever is going on in time. Yeah, so. yep, that's right. Good. Um, I sh I should give a, a chance to Janet. D Janet, d anything you want to uh, say or ask before we end? <laughs> oh, I'm not hearing you for some reason. Off. Oh shoot! I think I I think I didn't. Uh, I didn't uh, activate the sound. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, go ahead and email me. I'd love to hear what I'd love to hear what you have to say or what you have to uh, ask. But for some reason, I didn't set the sound up correctly. There is something in the there, chat box. Oh, there's something in the chat. Okay. Thank you. Uh, she says the the Eastern churches and mosques pay great attention to the physical structure of the buildings as themselves symbolic. Have we lost this in modern Western churches? Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's a great. Um, uh, the physical structure of the buildings as themselves symbolic. Yeah, I mean, um, that's probably, there, there's been um, a de-emphasis uh, on that in, the, in Western churches, certainly. I, I, think, I think Protestant, uh, the Protestant tradition, uh, for better and worse, um, uh, re really, Pulled, pulled emphasis off of the symbolic functions of the church building itself uh, for the sake of emphasizing the centrality of the preaching of the word. Pulpit is in the center and congregation is on the other side of the communion table and all the rest of it, it becomes secondary to the sort of, if we can say in the Protestant tradition, the icon of the uh, word preached in the congregation, <laughs> right? And so the, sim the symbolic structure of the church building itself becomes uh, really de-emphasized. Um, maybe there's some, there are certainly gains that come with that, but I think there are certainly losses of like the, the sort of what, what I tried to do with that uh, uh, Greek monastery, the Catholicon, um, like that's just not, that's that way of thinking about the church building just isn't in on the radar of pro Protestant churches. I've never encountered encountered it. And so maybe there's some, we've lost some resources for thinking about that. I don't know. Does that, is that okay? <laughs> I don't know. I'm always, I, even though this sort of came off as a very Eastern uh, uh, lecture and a sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Raising questions about the the ways that Western traditions depict this Im imagery, um, uh, that's that's not an anti-Western uh, kind of uh, uh, emphasis. Maybe it came across this way in this talk, but the 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 uh, traditions of Protestant, Catholic, uh, and of Orthodox churches in the West are are um, full of visual theological thinking that are very uh, um, important. Uh, to attend to. So just to sort of put that <laughs> footnote asterisk at the end. Okay, uh, we've gone on uh, far too long. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.